Hello and welcome to Mining Network's monthly Lithium Outlook. We're joined today by George Miller, analyst over at Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. George, thanks for coming on to the program. Um, we saw in Lithium back in 2017, one of the most impressive rallies in the metal sector uh, around that time period. Um, prices ended up, at, I believe, at the end of 2017, around the 18,000 US dollar mark per tonne. Um, we then saw a pretty brutal contraction in the market, and that lingered for a while, I'd say. Uh, we saw COVID lows around 5,000 US dollars per tonne, and we're now finally starting to see, since the pandemic, some, some revitalization in, in the lithium price. Prices this month are around the $13,500 mark. Um, to start things off, obviously, we, we had, I'd imagine, quite a lot of investors who were exposed to lithium, bought into the big demand hype back in 2017, who potentially didn't sell out in time and would have been burned the year or two after. Um, what's the likelihood of this rally um, having a, a similar story and anyone buying in at the moment, ultimately in a year or two's time? Um, are going to get burned again? Yeah, really good question. I would argue that um, investors in the lithium sector should always stay wary. You know, prices can be quite volatile. But the difference between this rising price environment and the last is that the dramatic increase um, we've seen in demand and consumer acceptance for EVs. Um, originally, in the last price cycle, prices spiked because initial demand from the lithium ion battery industry was enough to shock an otherwise relatively small and specialty chemical market. Um, on the flip side, this meant that when some initial large scale hard rock lithium supply came online in Australia, it was sufficient to satisfy demand and more in 2017 and 2018, um, which brought prices down to the levels we saw in late 2020. I feel this time round, the market has grown considerably bigger and EV and lithium demand is accelerating at incredible growth rates. So really the demand is truly there, which we didn't see during the last lithium price cycle. The supply fix to meet lithium demand can no longer be met by the development of a few spodumene mines. And instead, there needs to be a considerable international effort to develop a significant range of producing lithium assets in the near term in order for the supply side of the industry to keep up with demand. Good. And uh, moving on from that, I guess, um, would be good to hear what your supply and demand forecasts are looking like. I guess over the next sort of five years would be, would be good. And uh, potentially, if you could give away um, what, what do you think the price is, is going to happen uh, to, to that? <laughs> sure. So, um, yeah, touching on the last question, I suppose, kind of the, the low prices we saw over the past three years really hampered the ability of lithium producers to invest in their own expansion efforts. Um, throughout 2020, which was a, a really difficult year for the industry, we saw mines being put in care and maintenance and delayed expansion plans from, from even lithium majors. Um, this has meant that there's really not enough capacity within the supply pipeline to meet the demand we're anticipating over the next decade for EVs. Ultimately, we see only really incremental growth in supply over the next couple of years. And this is in the face of a 20 to 25% growth rate per annum in demand year on year for lithium. Um, while some may kind of bulk at these huge growth rates, uh, I think you only really have to take a look at EV sales so far this year um, compared to 2020 or even 2019, um, to realize that there's been a, a step change or a tipping point in demand. Um, and that's really begun to arrive. Given the lead times um, to bring a greenfield lithium asset through to battery grade production, there is really significant and imminent investment needed on the supply side of the industry if raw material supply is to keep going um, with the projected growth in demand. This actually sees our forecast develop a minor market deficit by the end of this year at approximately 10,000 tons LCE or lithium carbonate equivalent, um, which is projected to grow throughout the decade as we see demand outpace supply. Um, unless further plans are made on the supply side, that is. Um, but yeah, we anticipate things to grow to a deficit of about 50,000 tons LCE by 2025. Um, so certainly more investment needs to be put into the supply side of the industry to balance that out. And in terms of um, pricing at the moment, I think we were talking about earlier around, a, we're currently at the $13,500 mark. Um, I assume with this supply deficit, um, we might be expecting that to increase in the near term? We could do. Um, you know, that, that 13,000 number is, is our current kind of um, global weighted average for lithium carbonate. 
Um, at, at the peak of the last price cycle, we, we saw prices for lithium carbon at, you know, reach uh, close to or even sometimes above the $20,000 per ton mark. Um, we could begin to see those prices again in the lithium market. I would say, you know, the, the good side to that is it really incentivizes producers to begin to expand and, and balance out the market again, um, which is what we really need to see. And starting to see those incentive prices now is, is very beneficial for the supply side of the market. One of the other areas I, I definitely wanted to touch on is, uh, I guess, the, the sources of, of lithium. Obviously, we have brine deposits, um, which are usually then converted uh, into uh, the carbonate. And then you have uh, your hard rock, which can now be um, produced straight into a hydroxide with a much higher selling price. Um, could you potentially talk to us a little bit about the, the differences in cost of mining uh, the hard rock and the brines? And does the uh, overall selling price of the finalized product that, that the miners are, are, are producing, does that sort of outweigh the differences in cost in terms of how profitability these mining companies might be? Is, is, there, a, is there a clear favorite potentially for an investor, brine or hard rock? Sure. Um, really, really, the difference in price between the two products does, does balance that out. Um, historically, hydroxide has held a market premium of about um, $1,500 per ton over lithium carbonate. Uh, which accounts for the conversion cost from one to the other. So a carbonate producer in that sense can feasibly be successful in the hydroxide market also. Um, typically, hard rock does have the competitive advantage on cost to produce hydroxide, as you say, um, and, and brine producers have a lower cost base for producing lithium carbonate. So each respective production method does lead the market share in its advantageous chemical. But essentially, I'd say that there are kind of, you know, successful and unsuccessful market participants in both markets using any production method. Um, and generally, it comes down to whether each producer can get the right mix of volume and sales price for whichever product they produce. OK, looking, looking more into brines, um, something that I have heard um, from many, many people um, over the last year, it seems to be a bit of a talking point in the industry, is the chemical composite within the brines themselves. So apparently some, some fluids might be a bit more impure. There might be some chemicals in there which are very costly to extract. Um, first of all, I was wondering if you might be able to really tell us and, and, and investors out there looking to, to move into the lithium industry if they haven't already, um, what sort of chemicals they need to watch out for that, that could really sting them down the line? Yeah, I mean, you know, firstly, maybe I'd, I'd like to explain why it's hard to, to find answers out there. Um, you know, it, it's hard to give a clear answer to this question with such a range of resources and production techniques in the lithium market, which is why, you know, even the most experienced lithium producers can face quality troubles when it comes to producing consistent battery grade chemicals from any resource. Um, to give you some further detail, though, um, for brines, the magnesium to lithium ratio is the most important. Um, lithium and magnesium have very similar chemistries and, and are very difficult to separate from each other. So the, the higher the magnesium lithium ratio, the more expensive it is to separate the two. Um, as a rule of thumb, maybe for investors, anything above 10 is getting too high and, and it's going to be quite costly to separate those. Um, this has really been an obstacle for producers in areas like Qinghai province in China um, and also Bolivia, which is, is yet to really develop a commercial scale asset um, because the magnesium evaporates after the lithium. Besides that, um, sometimes overlooked to the sulfate lithium and boron lithium ratios as well. Um, increased ratios of these will lower lithium recovery rates and increase the use of reagents and the generation of waste from the production process. Um, speaking to producers, I've also heard that generally large proportions of magnetic or radioactive elements are also considered quite problematic as they're difficult to handle. Um, there are also a different set of elements that you need to consider in the end product. Um, for brine. And what can be particularly detrimental there is the sodium content in, in the end chemical. Interesting. Thank you. That's, that's something I haven't had an answer on. So, so appreciate that. Um, on to the, uh, I wanted to actually talk about something in terms of new technologies and, and techniques, um, because it is quite an exciting time in the mining industry. I think we have uh, in other metals, for example, we have the Kel process coming through, which is being developed by Palinhurst, which could revolutionize the palladium market we've got jetty resources who are um, potentially going to be changing the way that low-grade copper is being uh, produced in future which could really revolutionize that market um, there have been some studies um, out of Saudi Arabia in terms of 
um, being able to transfer seawater into lithium at a very, very high purity level. I think it was 99.93% uh, around that sort of mark. I'll pull a link to actually the study in, in the description below for anyone interested. And we are all, and that was actually proven to be economic when mixed with, uh, with other industries. And then we're also having this direct lithium extraction that's also being piloted around the world. I guess, uh, I guess one of the senses is that there is an abundance of lithium out there. It's just obviously extracting it is the hard part at the moment. How long do you think it might be until some of these new techniques really have a meaningful impact on the market and, and do affect the supply chain? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, th there are so many exciting developments on the supply side of the market. Um, you know, our benchmark, we, we certainly hope to see these new production um, technologies flourish in the lithium market eventually. Um, you know, it's really great for competition and ultimately may provide, you know, a wider base of supply for an industry that, that's desperately in need of that. Um, that said, you know, we kind of believe it will be late 2020s before we see meaningful production volumes from direct lithium extraction technology or any new kind of seawater extraction technology like you're mentioning. Um, you know, new technologies really takes time um, to develop from a bench scale up to a commercially viable production solution. Um, this is even more true when trying to reach a battery grade chemical, which is um, really a fine art or, you know, fine science, I suppose. Um, very difficult thing to do. And uh, to, to finish off on, uh, there's there's obviously been this uh, ongoing narrative within mining that, uh, or, or in general with um, global emissions and, and the climate crisis, is that the amount of carbon required to actually mine all the lithium and the nickel and the cobalt and, and whatever else to, to actually get the EV revolution, this electrification of the world and renewable energy sources up and going, um, will probably be emitting more carbon than, than, than what's beneficial. Um, I think we have, had, we have had a chat with this before. I found your answer interesting. It'd be really, really good to hear really what Benchmark's view of this is. Is this, uh, is this something that we're causing more harm in the, lo in the long term? Yeah, I mean, you know, these kind of arguments we, we really do hear repeated time and time again. Um, but fortunately, you know, from our perspective, these are entirely false. Um, I think the growth of electrification as a concept ha has been so rapidly adopted by governments exactly because it is less harmful than internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, and the investment into upstream raw material production is a necessary consequence of this. Um, you know, of course, we understand that mining doesn't have a great reputation for being environmentally friendly in many cases, but the alternative is the continued use of fossil fuels and internal combustion engines, which from cradle to cradle or, you know, kind of in other words, throughout their life cycle, these are far more emissive and harmful than the lithium ion equivalent. Um, in that sense, you know, we believe, you know, even the most diehard environmentalists should be convinced that mining might be a necessary evil to reduce our greater negative impact on the natural world. Um, as a side note, Benchmark has developed an ESG division, which um, we developed it last year, which is seeking to carry out life cycle analysis on the lithium ion supply chain and also release some environmentally focused reporting as well. Um, so keep an eye on us for more detailed kind of quantitative analysis on this. But in the meantime, viewers should feel free to take a look at you know, maybe Tesla's impact report is a good thing to point them to, or really environmental reporting by any major lithium producer to, to get an idea of how false this is. Perfect. No, I'm glad we're, we're squashing the argument here. Um, George, thank you so much for your time. Uh, for those of you not already aware of Benchmark, I will be putting um, some things on the screen now, which uh, cover a very wide range of services that they cover. I'd also recommend that you uh, you follow George on Twitter if you really want to keep up to date with the, the lithium and graphite story moving forward and that that too will be appearing on the screen george thank you so much